Please welcome Brad Englert, an author, advisor, and technologist with over 40 years of experience in the private and public sectors. Accenture for 22 years, including 10 years as a partner, and then the University of Texas at Austin for eight years, including seven years as the chief information officer. His recent book, Spheres of Influence, How to Create and Nurture Authentic Business Relationships, offers a practical guide to helping emerging and established leaders develop and perfect the critical hard skill of building effective and lasting professional relationships. You're going to want to stick around for today's episode as I have a wonderful conversation with Brad Englert. Welcome to Rat Race Reboot. I'm your host, Laura Noel, and as a certified coach and former 27-year military leader, each week I provide bite-sized mindset pivots that will help you reset your mind, reawaken your spirit, and regain your control. All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of Rat Race Reboot. I am really excited to dive into this topic of really authentically connecting with others, building solid networks, real networks. Um, As a business owner, myself and many of our listeners here, I think we're going to get so much value from this conversation. But first and foremost, welcome to the show, Brad. Thanks for inviting me. (laughs) You are most welcome. Uh, One of the ways that I love to start our show is oftentimes when people and guests find themselves moving in a specific direction with the trajectory of their career, it's often because along the way and through their life experience, they notice something is missing and they want to add value to the world and the marketplace. And I'm always curious, what got you from where you were to this point today, helping people in the way that you are? Well, I was very fortunate at Accenture to have excellent mentors and good bosses. I only had two clunkers in 40 years, so that's pretty good. Uh, And the culture of the firm was to build skills in other people. So even as a partner, I was expected to mentor staff. I was expected to go to our training center and teach. Even three months before I retired, I was teaching a class of 200 people from around the world on project management. So it's just the culture of building the firm. And when I started, uh, there were 40,000 consultants. And by the time I, right now, there's 700,000 consultants at Accenture. So it's, uh, and a lot of that was organic growth. So I, I enjoyed the mentoring. And when I got to the university, I had a, a, organization that needed a culture change and they were very much uh, kind of a fire drill you know let's swoop in and be heroics uh, and which is opposite of me I want to think ahead so I don't have to need need heroics <laughs> and so I enjoyed working with the, the my direct reports and the and the staff to change from fire drill to a customer focused culture and it took a couple of years, but I enjoyed that. And then after I retired from the university, I still mentor two or three people, but I thought, you know, that really doesn't scale. Um, I can't clone myself. How can I help more people, especially those in the early parts of their career or midpoint to help them be more successful? And so that's how I got to the idea of, well, I'll just write a book. And it took a lot longer than I thought, uh, pandemic being in the middle of it all. But uh, I've been pleased with uh, the reception it's been getting. Oh, that is so wonderful. Congratulations on your book. And you you. were talking backstage and you recently, well, you published, obviously, but then you earned like the bestseller status in a few different categories. Which categories were those? Um, This is Amazon bestsellers. It's leadership training, mentoring and coaching, and customer relations, which are actually all three were my target audiences. Oh, that's amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, I wanted to kind of touch on um, 
some of the aspects of relationship building and, and network building. And, um, you know, some of the, the topics that you seem to dive into deeply are really how can you how can you start to build your network, especially when you're starting out in a business? Mm-hmm. Or, you know, I was recently thinking about this. Um, maybe we can kind of put a pin in it. But how about people who are transitioning? Maybe they've had their network from a previous life and mm-hmm. now they're pivoting into something new. I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> 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 They're pivoting to something new. How do you navigate that? Um, but I'm really interested in, in hearing your thoughts. Well, there are three principles that relate to all business relationships. Number one is understanding their goals and aspirations. Second, set and manage expectations. And third, genuinely care about their success. If you do those three things, and do it intentionally with people you want to build a relationship with, you you will be successful. Who doesn't want to share their goals and aspirations? I mean, you want people to know what you're trying to achieve. Um, Setting and managing expectations, a very simple thing, but often doesn't happen. I had someone the other day promise to send me a proposal. It's been a month. I don't know if I'm ever going to get one. You know, it's like, how about... (laughs) You know, I will get you a proposal in one month. <laughs> and then um, and then genuinely caring about the success. So when I started at the university, there was a professor who'd been there for 40 years. I had worked with him on a strategy 15 years earlier. And I said, okay, give me some advice. He goes, get out of the office and tell people you give a damn. Oh, I love that. And that's what I did. I made sure that Every four to six weeks, I would intentionally meet with the peers and influencers in the university and just understand what are they trying to achieve? How can I help and uh, share with them initiatives that I'm undertaking? So we did everything to irritate everyone on campus. We changed to a new learning management system. We uh, changed to a new email system for staff and students. Now, there's 70,000 people, so what could possibly go wrong? (laughs) Uh, Voice over IP, 21,000 phones changed. So just having the dialogue with people who are your peers and influencers um, really built trust and uh, helped build not a transactional relationship. That's what I don't like about traditional networking. You know, you go to the event, you change business cards. I had someone say the other day, I went to an event and I got an email from someone I just met asking for money for their not profit. It's like, I don't even know this person. (laughs) Wow. So, you know, so I, I really wrote the book to say, forget the traditional networking, the superficial and to answer your question, be intentional. So who should I be meeting with? And then reach out. Yeah. I, you know, it's, it's so funny because with so many people, for example, even on the digital space on LinkedIn, I'm sure uh, many of us can uh, attest to having the experience of maybe somebody comes into your network it doesn't mean that we're networking or we know each other and then it's you know then the message oh you know oh i'm so happy we're in our network so tell me do you need help with x y and z that's right yeah Um, and it happens almost automatically and there's no there's no relationship there i and the, the caring piece that you've mentioned i'm more apt to have a conversation with somebody who's engaging with me and my material and what I'm putting out there in a caring way. And then over time, if they find, you know, a solution to something, I'm, I'm more open to have a conversation with them. Sure. Sure. That's right. Yep. It, uh, it, yeah. I see so much of that out there. Um, so that. Being curious about other people, I like that. Get out there and show people you care. It reminds mm-hmm. me of 
some of the work that I do with the Arbinger Institute, where they have a couple of of things that they ask their teammates to do with each other. And it's a, a meet to learn mm. where you're just scheduling a meeting to learn about another person. Yeah. Um, and even a meet to give where you're not, it's not transactional. You're not right. asking for something. You're actually taking the time to think about what did I just learn about this person? Mm. And what, what did they say their challenges were? Was I really listening Right. How, how could I, you know, help them? Not in a, you know, give to get kind of way, but genuine care. And that's right. You know, even if it's an introduction to somebody else that can help them. Mm -hmm. And there are two, them. there are two spheres of influence that I describe in the book. The first yeah. sphere is those relationships you have the most direct impact. So your boss, direct reports, executive leaders, and all your staff. I mean, you're interacting with them every day. Uh, the external sphere of influence is those relationships you have left direct impact, customers, uh, peers and influencers, and vendor partners. And I describe in all those different relationships, you know, how do you understand their goals and aspirations of your boss? Mm -hmm. You know, it's simple. You just ask. You know, some people are scared to ask or afraid to, yeah afraid to ask and it's like when i was the boss i in, i was happy when people asked what are my goals and what am i trying to achieve and how they could help me achieve that so um setting and managing expectations i had a client who um wonderful client and they asked me to fix this huge transformative project lead it and it was in October, and I said, well, I, I'm happy to do this. So I can, I know we'll be successful. However, next June, I have a vacation plan to go to Australia. I was an exchange student there, 25th uh, reunion. I really need to go. And I want to take my family. And I wanted to go last year, but I canceled it due to business. So I really want to go. So fast forward, we made a major milestone in April of the next year. And in our monthly meeting with the president, the provost and the CFO, I said, uh, Mr. President, I want to remind you as I have the last four months that I'll be going on vacation to Australia next month <laughs> for three weeks. Yeah. And his hand started shaking and I'm slow mowing, canceling my vacation. <laughs> and the, C the CFO says, oh, stop, Brad, stop. Uh, Mr. President, when Brad joined us in October, he asked if he could schedule this vacation. Uh, the provost and I agreed, and uh, he said, Diane's going to be in charge. Uh, we have confidence in her. We should uphold our commitment. And so I got to go on a three-week vacation with my family. Uh, didn't check email. Didn't check voicemail came back, everything was fine. And so uh, about 15 years later, I'm having dinner with the CFO and his wife and my wife. And we talked about that incident. And he goes, we were scared to death when you were gone. <laughs> <laughs> but we set and managed the expectation. And they, so, so you can't have balance in your life. You yeah. just have to use your words. And and your boss isn't a mind reader. Your customer isn't a mind reader. So uh, there's a theme throughout the book of use your words and <laughs> your people are not mind readers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How often, you know, I just did a whole series recently on the topic of burnout. Mm. And we have so much power within ourselves yes. to change the course of it, really anything. And we have to use our words. We have to be willing one, to get clear on what it is we really want, the outcome we really want. That's right. And then communicate that. Um, and sometimes it's finding, um, understanding what the other person needs and, and figuring out how can we both have what we need. And so it may not be within, it may not be within your organization. You, right. you may say, well, if you want to try that, go try it. And if you don't like it, you know, we don't say this to everybody, but you can come back. <laughs> I had a 
a very talented network engineer and in Austin's high tech city. A um, lot of big tech companies and startups. Well, he was going to work for the startup and we offered him lots of money, uh, more than we could as a university. Um, dry cleaning, free dry cleaning, food all the time. But I said, look, if you don't like it, call us and you can come back. Well, two weeks later, guess what? He called us. <laughs> it was just a madhouse. And they fed him because he could never go home. Wow. And he got more money, but which he thought would help his family, but he was further from them when he was with the university. So can I come back? It's like, yeah, of course you can. <laughs> And yeah, he stayed with us for many, many years. Oh, that's oh, that's such a great story of, you know, really when you have that relationship, you can take risks yeah. like that. And you know that you, you still have a soft place to land. Cause because at the end of the day, when we're building relationships, we're seeing people, <laughs> right. you know, as human beings and not just, you know, pieces of a puzzle <laughs> that we're that's moving right. around or pawns. Um, yeah. that's incredible. Well, when you think about the aspects of your book and these two different, I guess, constituents or different groups of people mm -hmm. who you're really building relationships with, um, and you mentioned, you know, in understanding goals of the people you're working with and sharing those along the way with, with mm -hmm. your boss or your team, but those external customers, how might that look a little bit different? Well, it's um, customers want you to help them succeed. And what I found is that success fuels more success. And at Accenture, more than 80% of our customers are repeat customers. Well, why is that? You've built trust, you've had success, and Frankly, it costs a lot more to get a new customer than to retain an existing customer. So you pour your resources into maintaining a very happy customer. And their needs change over time. I had one customer who, new customer, and they were implementing a payroll system and an accounting system. Well, they wanted to go with a cheaper alternative and I, I said to my client, well, they don't have the project management skills. They don't have the experience, but call me if you need help. Well, nine months later, the payroll system was in trouble. The actual interface to accounting didn't work. And she called. And I said, Susan, why didn't you call me earlier? <laughs> and she goes, well, sometimes we have to burn our hands on the stove before we uh, learn. And I just said, for the love of God, why? <laughs> but then we came in. I had a very talented team. And they had, we had the best chemistry ever on that project and just knocked it out of the park. And so at the end, she goes, okay, yeah, I probably should call you sooner. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, wow. What a way to, to maintain those relationships, regardless of, hey, I'm going to try this on my own. OK, not a problem. Here's right. my insights. Like we want to be we want to be helpful. Right. And I'm here if you need support. And that, like you said, it builds trust. Well, and sometimes um, you can't tell and you have to be honest and just say, you know, I'm not really the one to help you, but here's someone who can and, you know, that always uh, pays forward. Absolutely. I find that in my profession as an organizational psychologist um, and a coach, you know, it's, hey, that, that's not my area of expertise. I think there's somebody who's better right. and I, I'll, I'll share that. I'd and same, thing, same thing as an employee. Yeah. If a boss asks you to do something and you're not, you don't have the skills or capacity to do it, you need to talk about it. There's a client I had who put someone who's a 30-year employee in charge of a big project. Well, he had never done it before. And so I came in to take over and I said, you asked him to do something he wasn't prepared to do. This is to the leadership. Right. And so there should be no consequences other than thanking him for his service. 
and he actually worked for me and we had a successful conclusion, but he should have said no. He should have said, I, I love you guys, but I, I don't have the skills to do it. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the responsibility goes both ways. I, I can mm-hmm. think of times when um, I was asked, can you facilitate this material and managing the expectations? Mm-hmm. Yes, I can. However, I haven't done it before. Right. And here's what I need. And can we meet to just make sure that I'm spun up and I have mm-hmm. my questions answered? That's um, so important. It, so yeah. I so I had a boss one time, type A personality. She everything she wanted was fast, 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 rush, 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 um, urgent, urgent, urgent. When you'd get a call to go to her office, it's always like, oh no, nine out, nine times out of ten, it would be tough love, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so one day is five o'clock. I'm trying to leave on time for lunch to meet my wife for dinner. The phone rings. Well, it's her. Brad, I need a white paper. A white paper. <laughs> and I literally said, whoa. When do you need this white paper? Oh, oh, uh, let me check my calendar. Oh, I don't need it for two weeks. Oh, I thought you needed it tomorrow. Um, how many pages do you want this white paper to be? Oh, uh, 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 three to five. I was thinking ten. Right. Do you, do you have an example of a white paper that I can look at? Oh, yeah, yeah. I did one on XYZ Corporation 10 years ago. I asked David to give that to you. Well, guess what? I went home. Instead of staying up all night working on a 10-page white paper that was in the wrong format, and she would yell at me for not meeting her expectation. But just by saying, whoa, kind of slowed down the conversation slow down the thinking to do what you just said to align the expectations. And it was a win, win, win instead of lose, lose, lose. Yeah. Yeah. That's a so just say whoa. Thing. Just yeah. say whoa. It's not no, because no will set them off. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I like it, that. It has to be whoa. <laughs> I, I like a, that. I had a client at the university, IT director. So you're just telling me no. No, I'm just saying, whoa. (laughs) Yeah. I love that. I'm going to use that. Yeah. You're so right. How often do we jump into things? We're we're always in such a rush. I I, I think I always say we're going to pay now or we're going to pay later. Yeah. Now in a little bit of time. Exactly. Say, whoa, and have a more meaningful conversation to get aligned Yes. Or we're going to pay in heartache and much more time later. So my direct reports at the university, I asked several of them to review the manuscript, and they reminded me of things I, I forgot about. And one was I told them to slow down. Don't rush in, remember, with the fire truck, and yeah, don't be swooping in with your cape. Stop and let's understand what the problem is. Take some time. I had, you know, some of it, it took us 40 years to get this way. What's another week? <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter. So understand what the issue is. And sometimes, and this technique is called intentional foot dragging. Sometimes you just need to let it sort itself out. And it solves itself. You don't even have to do anything. Yeah. And just the idea of having that patience, you know, they, they appreciate that I encourage them to be patient and not just rush headlong in to solve things, but to actually be more thoughtful. Yeah. I, I feel like a big part of our culture is to be a human doing instead of a mm-hmm. human being. And mm-hmm. it's almost like, you know, when you have moment to pause, I know from my experience it being that type A, it's like, I don't know what to do with my hands. Like I, <laughs> I have to be doing something. I'm, and, and we're not thinking, we're not thinking like mental activity doesn't constitute thinking. We're right. just being bounced around by all of these external circumstances and that right. whoa, and that pause, that intentional feet dragging. <laughs> <laughs> we need that. We need that pause. Well, I had a, a, 
someone acting in my as the CIO when I was on vacation one time. And you know, I snuck a peek at the email and I saw an issue and I thought, I'm not gonna do anything. I'm just gonna let that ride. And of course when I got back it had resolved itself. It he he didn't even need to do anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's amazing how things often resolve and people step up to the challenge. I don't know if you've yeah. seen this with other leaders where it's hard for them to let go of some of the things that yes. they're working on. So they're trying to do everything um, and they're not really empowering their team to right. make mistakes. So I had seven direct reports at the university and at early on, they would come to me with a problem with one of their peers and my first question was, well, what did they say when you talked to them? <laughs> well, of course, they hadn't talked to them. Right. And it's like, well, I'm not doing anything until you go talk to them. <laughs> and over time, they learned not to come to me to be the rescuer and the help, you know, savior and solve all their problems. They worked it out themselves. And yeah. they were empowered. Mm, yeah, much more equipped to solve their own problems. There's an old uh, Harvard Business Review article talks about um, employees putting the monkey on your back as the boss. And your job as the boss is to take the monkey and show it to him and say, this is your monkey. It's not my monkey. <laughs> and and it's, it's a classic, I think it was done mid seventies, you know, so they're talking about typewriters and stuff. <laughs> But he noticed that his staff were out leaving early and golfing and stuff, and he's working all weekend. <laughs> he says, wait a minute, how did all these monkeys get on my back? <laughs> so I, I, I did a lot of uh, monkey recognition. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Yeah, you got to recognize them and get them off your back. <laughs> exactly. I love that. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, this is, you know, there's so much wisdom here and so much goodness. It's it's often what we're talking about, counterintuitive, uh, mm -hmm. when we're in these positions of leadership or we're up and coming and really solving problems. But it, it really comes down to um, slowing down, thinking yeah. through things. Be intentional. Being intentional, having conversations, actual conversations instead of making assumptions. Yeah. Um, that's a, a huge, that's a missing piece in a lot of the challenges we're faced with. Well, I had people my age who've read the book say, I wish I read this like 30 years ago. <laughs> yeah. And they're giving it to their adult children who are in the workforce because yeah. no one teaches us at business school. You know, they, they just don't. And so I, I've been really pleased with that. Uh, someone else said, well, oh, Brad, this is just common sense. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't have common sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, it's one thing to know something intellectually, and it's mm. quite another to um, take some of these ideas that we intellectually may know, but we right. haven't adopted. We don't know them. They're, they're not internalized. So a woman who worked for me at the university uh, branched off, started her own consulting firm in creative thinking, brilliant woman. I retained her recently to help me build a half day workshop where we actually practice all these principles yeah. and get scenarios and do some role playing and help. Cause you have to exercise, you have to exercise these skills and you don't have to be born with it. You know, it's a learnable skill. Uh, just like computer programming, you can learn that. <laughs> so, well, and to your point, I think a lot of these skills, like I, I my research is on intuition and mm. intuition in business, and that's an innate part of us. We intuitively know how we should treat another person, mm. and we intuitively we're we're guided in a lot of ways. But how often do we get so busy? Yeah. <laughs> in our mind that we don't listen. Um, and that lends itself to the creativity that you're talking about too. Well, and frankly, it's more rewarding to take the time to have an intentional relationship than a transactional. It's more fun. It is. Um, at the university, one of my closest uh, colleagues 
was in charge of public safety. And he was a military war hero. He uh, went and got his PhD after serving. And he went to the Ohio State University, which was one of my clients. So we just had a natural, I, I love the Ohio State University. We just had this natural bond. And I said to him, first meeting, it's not if, it's when there'll be problems. We need to be prepared for problems. And he appreciated that. We had a bomb scare, we had a murder, we had a shooting. You know, over eight years, you have to be ready. And his team and my team worked very closely together. We would actually practice, have drills to practice how we would act in certain situations mm -hmm. and how we would act in situations we didn't anticipate. And, and it was really, a you know, we worked so well together um, because I met with him every, with him every four weeks because it was, we had a lot of stuff going on, you know, whether it's a football game of a hundred thousand people or commencement, you know, you need to be ready. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And in, in high stakes situations, particularly with safety, if you have that yeah. trust already, that exactly. foundation built, then you can respond versus be so reactive. Right. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, this has been so wonderful. I hope that I hope you all listening really take heed to this message of taking the time to do a lot of these things that we're often conditioned not to do mm -hmm. because we're so in the grind and putting our head down in the moment and doing our work. But, but to your point, yeah. you will save more time if you are thoughtful in the beginning. Yeah. It's like you Building a house, you have a blueprint. So, right, have yeah. a blue, create a blueprint. <laughs> I love that. Well, Brad, is there anything that we've left unsaid today? I know there's so much to talk about in your book and the work you're doing, but is there anything else that you'd like to leave our listeners with before we close for today? Well, we have um, a unique web page for Rat Race podcast, and I think you'll put the link in. Uh, at the time, but it's bradengler.com is the website and there's a backslash rat race backslash. Um, I offer a sampling of the book. I offer a link to how to buy the book. And then if you want to talk with me, a, a calendar link. So I would encourage folks to reach out. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate you pouring into our audience. Thank you for being here. You bet. Thank you. For those of you listening, I'd love to hear your thoughts and insights. Um, please leave us a five-star review, whatever platform you listen to podcasts on. Um, leave us your comments. We read them and I want to hear from you. Uh, always, we have some freebies and giveaways on the ratracereboot.com. Again, thank you so much for being here. And always remember, everything is created twice, first in our mind and then in physical form. Have a wonderful rest of your week. 